Stay tuned for the Joan Quinn Profiles. Joan served the state of California as a member on the Arts Council and on the Film Commission. She was formerly on the Architectural Commission and fulfilled two terms on the Fine Arts Commission for the city of Beverly Hills. As an editor for Andy Warhol's Interview Magazine, Condé Nast Publications, and the Hearst Corporation, Joan covered the world of fashion, the mysteries of food, the excitement of theater, and the international art scene. She continues to find people who are on the cutting edge of their professions. Here's Joan Agajanian Quinn. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome to the Joan Quinn Profile. We're taping at our studio in the Hollywood Museum on Highland Avenue, and waiting to be profiled are artists Susan Woodruff and actor Joe Oreck. Born and raised in Arizona, artist Susan Woodruff followed four generations who explored the deserts and vistas of the American West. She attended Arizona State University on an art scholarship where she became proficient in painting, sculpting, printmaking, and illustrating. Along with her NEA grant, Susan uh, received residencies and had shows in galleries and museums around the world and uh, across the US. You've, you're, you're in a lot of uh, collections all around. So when I say her family goes back, tell us about those influences from way back. Oh, from way back. Well, I only am in touch with, with my mother's side of the family, but my father's side was on the Mayflower. My mother's <laughs> side was, well, not one of the, you know, second sons, but one of the servants. And my mother's was the first generation Irish, so I'm half Catholic, half Wasp. And my influences came from, I think, my grandparents who went to Arizona. Um, I, I don't even know the year, but... It but it was, was such a dry place for them to go, right? Coming uh, across, you said, like that? It was a place people went when they were sick. Yeah. And my grandmother had TV. Ah. And when you talk to many, many people in Arizona, they, they went <laughs> because they were sick. And unfortunately, she healed. And uh, I grew up in the desert and just able to wander and run around and first on foot and then on a dirt bike. I know, they say you're like a big hiker and you're a, a motorcycle rider. Boogie, boogie boarding I do out here. Where do you boogie boarding out? In the, the in Pacific? Me Manhattan Beach. In, in the Pacific <laughs> Ocean? Yes. <laughs> yes. So tell me the one thing that was so interesting when you talked about living in the desert and having that, um, that freedom. Is, you learned to talk to the rocks oh, or to read the rocks. <laughs> I didn't necessarily, t well, they didn't answer. They didn't but, answer? Well, it seemed like but, they uh, answered. Well, maybe, yes, yes, maybe they did. My grandfather was a miner. He's a prospector. Ah. So my family was kind of this desert bohemians. <laughs> and what he taught me is to look at a rock and say, this one might have gold, this one has copper, ah. um, the geographical kind of uh, issues with the rocks. Uh, my grandmother was one of the first founding members of the Church of Self-Realization in Arizona, which was pretty wild. So were you meditating in, in the desert like that? I grew up meditating, believing in uh, everything, believing in everything. We practiced witchcraft. There was nothing that my grandmother didn't believe in. How did she learn all those things? She was self-taught. She read a lot, and, and the church was there. She didn't start it. She was a member of it. Of the self-realization. And that was the first Western church to practice Eastern religion. But, but so the rocks influenced your life a lot. I believe uh, having that access to that beauty and that light and that space and all of those all of those elements did influence me. Were they, in, were they informing your work at that time? When you were, you were sculpting, you were, were you using, what materials were you using? I was, I always use uh, light and space. And I was using, oh. I was casting fiberglass at that time. I was painting very geological looking abstractions. I illustrated because I um, am a self-supporting artist all my life. So I illustrated as jobs. But what, what working I, for, yeah. But what I loved was freelance, and what I loved, what I started to love was abstraction. 
because it's so universal and you can take that anywhere and someone can relate to that. But you talk about the work that we talk about looks like you're looking down on the on the the earth. Yes. Well, now did you ever go up high and look down? From a plane and I've I've climbed, but I I'm a NASA, NASA nerd, you know. I get oh, all the are? photographs. I get all the science sites, the oh. space sites, the you know, I'm a mad scientist in my mind, own mind when I work in my studio. I have a very specific method to come up with these, these paintings. And that is what informs me, all of those things. The paintings look, I'm just going to say, look like this. Yes. This is a portrait which you did, which is fantastic. And they're not all like this, but they look like this because they have like a free flow. Yes. How do you, what kind of material do you use? on these pieces? These are, uh, this is a method that I've developed over the, over the past 10 years, and it is um, acrylic paint, and oh. I'm using it on a table I designed. I designed and drew up this table, and Jack Brogan built it for me, the great art fabricator. Wonderful guy. And this moves and tilts, and, and I have complete control. How does it move? Control. How big is it? It can go, I can paint up to 60 by 90 paintings on it. Like a six, five foot, and, six foot painting? And probably larger. I could probably go larger. And you say you designed it. What, yes. what does it look like? It looks like an easel. Uh, it on was a standing stand. up? It, will, it can stand or it can lay flat. It moves around and I can control. You know, there's, it's a history of flow painting. You should just throw from one side to the other. That's what I mean. That's why I would think that it would be flat more than on an easel. I can flow in, in any direction. Oh, you I can? I flow this way. I can flip it and flow that way. You know, it just, I have complete control over its flowing. And then I use a, a lot of different methods to keep the paint wet for a long period of time so I can really work on it and add a lot of colors to it. What do you use? Brushes? Sticks? No, no gravity. Just gravity. all totally gravity, yes. you manipulate that way? Yes. And evaporation and viscosity and... So it takes time. And, this would yes. take yes. time to do. Yes. You can't just uh, no. do a piece and have it move around and then... It's, no. It, does it, it dry and then you, then you manipulate it some more? No, it's all... The, the painting's done in all one time. It's wet. It's a wet on wet painting. And when it's done, I have to stop it and dry it, which is a whole other process. And that's why I feel like I have a hazmat suit on there. I'm in there spraying. There's a lot of things going on. And, and I also spraying have Spraying with what? Water to keep it wet keep enough. It. To, it's acrylic, so it won't dry. Certain parts of it I let dry. So certain parts of it oh, I dry. I see. I so see. that I get this cracking by drying it before this, which is, is flowing. You're, you have a show at the Katie Cohen Gallery. And there is something written by this math professor about fractals and painting, um, uh, patterns and gravity force. Mm -hmm. How does that affect your work? Wh well, I was showing in Budapest maybe five years ago, and I met this professor, and he said to me, you're painting fractals. And I, at the time, I didn't know <laughs> what that was, and I looked it up, and I said, yes, I am. I am painting fractals. You're painting fractals. I'm painting fractals. That's my theory, and I'm sticking to it. I, I know that <laughs> fractals are math, and that most fractals are mathematical computer generated images but there are self similar fractals in nature clouds and ocean lines and rocks are fractals even our brains are fractals did you take a lot of science classes i have only read i didn't i did take science classes but i've done a lot of reading and research on science i love science too so you so you research with you read the books like you read the rocks in yes. a way yes Yes, I do. I take what I want from that. And so I feel like I'm painting natural fractals. And the patterns are happening. I, I just started to see patterns. I started to see one painting I did uh, the day that Venus went, was tr in transit. Venus went over. I painted that day. I called it Venus in transit. And then <laughs> afterwards, I was looking at that painting going, it's really dark and turbulent on the outside and then very calm and tranquil on the inside. And I kept looking at the pattern in the middle, which is very wavy. And, and then finally, I, I looked up a picture that a picture of myself river rafting, and it was almost the exact pattern of the water. Is that right? So you can see that pattern from 
not, you know, I was in the river. I didn't see it that way at the but time. But from nature, is that yeah, it? Exactly. I think those are memories that, that maybe we all have. And what about color then? The color I also take from nature, and I can remember, like the color of your hair. Oh. That's how I did the portrait. I know you the one time. Because you had only seen me that one time. So. And, and we were at the Catherine Cohn Gallery. Yes. Um, Katie is having a show of yours, which is called the Echo Maker series, right? Yes. What is Echo Maker? Echo Maker is the name, or a name, the uh, Native Americans use for cranes. And it's a book by Richard Powers, and it, it's about migration and brain patterns and patterns in nature. So do you look at the brain and also paint? Is, is, is that part of an influence? Well, I think the patterns are, are in our brains. I think they're just, they're in there. And whether you're conscious of it or not, I'm not thinking while I'm painting about this particular water. It just happened. Sometimes you mean it just it, came to you? It has come to me. And one time I did a... Uh, Dragon's Tail that was in the show at, at, at Catherine's, at the group show, and that pattern I saw it after I painted it in the sky in a sunset. I took a picture. So it was just in, it was in your brain pattern, yes. so to speak, oh, just that's... like this was when when it came. Yes. Tell me the process of this piece. Well, this one I don't have to use an easel for. I can do that with, you know, I can hold it, hold uh -huh. it, tip it. You hold it, and, do it. It. and it's on yeah, wood. I, it's on a very thin wood panel which I back with uh, something that I can hold on to so I can control it. And I put all the paint on it once in a, in a way that I know how to do it. And I just move it and tip it and move it and tip it until it's right and then I stop it and that's Do you keep part. adding color or do you put all the color on at once? I do uh, one pass of all the colors and then I go over it again and I put more color. I polish it. I feel like I'm um, polishing oh, it you like a do stone. You, how do you polish it? With color, with removing, taking it away, putting it Not back. Not sandpaper. Sometimes I might. Oh, you do? Because, because the paint, I can get the paint to crack on the top, and then the paint underneath shows I can rub pigment into the crack. It's very smooth. Yes, it looks textured, but it's not. It's textured. very smooth. Um, I know in the um, Catherine Cohn Gallery you have a piece called Smoke. Yes. And that's influenced by? <laughs> that is self-evident. Sometimes my names are, you know, I finish the painting, I say, okay, that's smoke. Sometimes I, I keep a book of names. Of what color is names. smoke? Uh, it's a gray and uh, black and brown and... Uh, smoke. It's smoke. And then ghosting smoke. is another piece. Ghosting was, uh, that's influenced from George O'Keefe, uh. one of my favorite heroes, which you would not necessarily see right away and influence, but And from the desert too, right? From the desert. I use a lot of feminine symbolism. Ah. I do a lot of po poppy looking, uh, you know, flowery metals of my abstracts. So that's ghosting. And then ghosting. what about afterburn? Afterburn, the same as smoke. It just feels like embers. It feels like after the fire. And, and the, because we have JPEGs of these, we have pictures of these, and the black eyes? Black Ice came from a series I did one last summer. I was boogie boarding every week with my friend. Every week we would boogie board, and after that I would paint. And I thought, I'll get all this, you know, <laughs> waves, I'll get ocean, all right. I'll get wind. And then what I got was I got ice. I got ice cracking. Blue so what was that? Cracking. Just because that's how you came out of the boogie boarding? That's how your body, that's how you were thinking? I wasn't thinking it. It, it, it just happens. You know, I don't. What I think is going to happen does not usually happen. Oh, Almost it? never happens. <laughs> this one, I, I had an intent. You know, I had a purpose for that one. But this one? It came out similar to what I wanted. So it tell happened. me the sizes that you work in. From th this size. Uh, and this size, 12 by 12? Yes, to 48 by 90. In Echo Maker, it will be 48 by 60 to 48 by 90. And they're all pieces. on little wood, thin wood panels. They're on thin wood panels, and then they're mounted on wood. So oh, and then they're, they're mounted, mounted afterwards. Do you do all that work yourself? Can no. you do that? You can't do it. I, no, I, I wouldn't want to. Do you still draw? I do, yeah, for fun. And, and, and um, do you tend towards certain colors, or does it just come? The colors come and go. I love very bright colors. Oh, you do? And I use very basic, you know, prim primary colors sometimes, red being one of them. But this series I've gotten a little somber on. It's gotten a kind of black and white and brown and smoky. And I think often afterwards, then I know 
why it happened. Not then you, then you figured it out. But I do know that they are patterns, that that is why the name Echo Maker happened. That's so great. Thank you so much, Susan, for coming today. Thank you. And thanks for this beautiful portrait. You're welcome. And don't go away. We'll be right back with actor Joe Oreck. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome back to the Joan Quinn Profiles. We're here in our studio at the Hollywood Museum on Highland Avenue in the heart of Hollywood. I'm here with actor, performer, hoofer, Joe Oreck, who was born and raised in New York, spent time in the Air Force where he was the welterweight champ. He earned a BFA from St. Mary's College and an MFA from USC School of Dramatic Arts. You've seen him on TV episodes and on the big screen and in theaters across four continents you've been. So did you go from high school to the Air Force? I did. You I did? did. Yes, that I was did. your education? Why yes. did you do that? Was boxing your high school sport? Oh, uh, well, it was one of them, yeah. After I got thrown off the other teams, uh, <laughs> football, basketball, lacrosse, I had to do something on my own and boxing was in, it was in the blood. It, it was in the blood? Yeah, yes. Did it come from the family? Yes. My, oh, oh, tell us. Yeah, my, my father's from Puerto Rico. Ah. So a long line of Puerto Rican fighters, and my uncle was a uh, an army welterweight champ. My brother was the heavyweight champ in New York. Really? And I became the yeah. And heavyweight, my was, yes. heavyweight, and what's welterweight? How? Uh, one hundred and forty-seven pounds. And heavyweight is sixty. Uh, huh? No, it's a hundred and. I think 90 and above. Oh, it's that high? Yeah, my brother was about 205 at the time. What a difference, huh? Yes, yes. And so, he did he go on to, he did, he was in New York as a champ? Yes. And, and was he, he Oreck? Uh, he's an Oreck. <laughs> oh, yeah, Oreck? yeah, Mike. <laughs> Mike? Yeah, yeah. Mike, Joe? Yeah, well, his name is, it's Michael Joseph, and I'm Joseph Michael. The other way around. <laughs> yeah. So, so here you are, you're in the Air Force, you're fighting. Mm -hmm. Are you dancing yet? No, I'm not dancing. So when did you decide to be a dancer? Well, I decided after, um, I had taken some ballet classes for my footwork in the ring. I wondered about that. Yeah, so my, my trainer, Tony Fortunato, said, why don't you take some classes, ballet, for your, for your footwork? So I did, and secretly I fell in love with it, but I didn't tell anybody, because at the time, especially in a Puerto Rican family, you don't want to tell your father that you You're like ballet. You're a ballet dancer. Exactly, exactly. I went to ballet class this morning, so I know what you mean. Right, right, exactly. So um, <laughs> after I came out of the service, I was driving a truck, and I realized that um, I, 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 boxing wasn't for me anymore because I, I was fighting, I was going to turn professional, then got scared and decided um, this isn't for me. I was driving a truck in the city and stopped on 52nd Street and Broadway, saw all these Russian names on this uh, on the awning and I went up at, uh, and took a ballet class at the New, New York Conservatory of Dance. Oh, you did? Yeah. You went up and took a class? Yeah, yeah. Parked the, parked the truck, ran up. Unbelievable. Instead of doing my deliveries and then I, I finished my, uh, took my class, came down, finished the deliveries and, 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 and uh, went home. You on. took a ballet class? Yes. But really tap is probably better for fighting, isn't it? It's it's similar in a way because it's, it's all about you know, uh, changing weight on, on, on the feet. For so, tapping. For tapping, yeah. exactly. And that's what you do now. Yes, a ballet, I realized soon that I wasn't going to be a ballet dancer, and I saw Gregory Hines on a PBS special. And, and that's and that was your influence? That was my influence. And in my... Well, what a great influence. Yeah, and in my ignorance, I said, I can do that. It's five well, years later, I'm dancing with Gregory. So did you bring, so did you bring your shoes? <laughs> uh, well... <laughs> I know you can't tap here. I can't tap here, but I do have them. They're in my trunk of my car. Oh, we missed out yeah, on well, that. Well, next can, time. What kind of, what do they look like? They have a, a six, four inches of, of metal on the well, end? Well, they have metal in the, on, on the heel. Yeah. And then in the front, about maybe an inch and a half, two inches of metal on, shaped like the front of the shoe. So, does it matter what kind of metal is on that shoe? It, it does. You know, there, there are different makers of, of, of the taps. Um, and I know even friends of mine who make their own. So oh, that, it, it, I wondered about yeah, that. Yeah, it, it does give different, uh, it, it's a different sound, different taps. But then also the, the floor you're on must be different too. Absolutely, absolutely. And that's important. You know, there are people who mic the shoes. There are people oh, who mic the floor. I was going to ask you about that. So, uh, but, but the floor is very important and it has to have a certain reson resonance to, to uh, a sound. They can mic the floor? Yes. 
Yeah. I've seen them mic the shoes, and yeah. I've seen the mics come off and be flying around yes, the stage. Yes. Has that ever happened to you? Um, no, <laughs> but I've stepped on my mic because it, 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 it became like, loose, <laughs> and I damaged the microphone. Um, and then what happens the rest of the show? Well, the rest of the show, the... the, the uh, the, the fella in the in the booth has totally turned it off, and oh. and so you uh. can't hear it. But then they brought another mic. To, someone will come and, and put a mic on the floor. Oh, they oh on the floor. On the floor, so oh, you can oh, still hear the tap. Because you need that, right? You do, yeah. With the band, you know, you want to hear the the. Uh, the okay, mic. so you said you danced yeah. with Gregory Hines. I have. And did he find you? Was there was there a, some kind of story to this? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Tell me that story. Well, G Gregory <laughs> had uh, seen me in different studios in New York City, and then saw my name in a, a small paper. Uh, I was performing my first show with my uh, former partner, uh, Rod Ferone. We were doing a show downtown New York City, and on opening night, Gregory Hines in the, in the audience. How great. Oh, it was great. He threw his shoes down at the end of the show. He's so great. Oh, it, 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 <laughs> he was, it was so great. It was great. And it, it, was, it was just a great night. And then you also danced with Savion Glover. I, on Broadway? Uh, on the stage? Uh, of stages in this country, and not on Broadway, but in Europe, all over this country, oh, and, and in Canada. All over? You you traveled with him? Yeah, so yeah. So how many p dancers did he have with him? Because I saw him on Broadway, and I think, what, four or five? It depends on what show, but when we went, um, it was just Savion, and it was a guy named Ted Levy, another great tap dancer, who co choreographed uh, Jelly's Last Jam with Gregory. Oh, oh. So it was Savion, Ted, my ex-partner Rod and myself, and Is that just, it for the four and we brought four musicians from the states. So it was only three, really, because Savion's the headliner, right? Oh so, so, yeah. <laughs> so, so, I mean, so, how does he do it? Can you do all those things? Never. In my dreams, I can't do what he does. Why he's, is it? He's, well, I mean, even Gregory said he's a genius. He he is. He's so gifted. He taps on his toes. Oh, I mean, well, he does. There are other people who tap on his toes, but 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 Savion is so far ahead. He's like, if you can compare in basketball, he's Michael Jordan to the rest of the mere mortals. And they're great. The and rest they're of great. The mere mortals and some are of them great. great. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I, I actually, he's like a, he's like a son. I mean, we is that right? yeah, we go back probably twenty five years. Oh wow. He is bringing my show in my corner. To New York. In My Corner is what we're going to talk about because you're dancing in that. But before we get to In My sure, Corner, sure. let's talk about all these old timers Absolutely. that you do, like Honey Coles. Yes. Did you? Uh, I danced with Honey. I danced, you did? I, I danced with Honey. I danced with the Nichols Brothers. I danced with a guy who's my f my favorite, uh, Jimmy Slide. Um, did they all have their own styles? All had their own styles. And did you learn from them? Everything I possibly could. <laughs> really? I mean, I, I just walking around with them. You know, I just, especially Jimmy, because he was jazz personified, and everything he said made some, it meant something to me. It was like, it, it was life. It was it, instruction. We called it Tap University. Oh, that's great. Right? <laughs> yeah. And we did it. Uh, 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 it so were the, they nice to you? Were they like mentoring? Mentoring, just, um, just being around them. They were, they were great men. Great men, you know. I mean, as great as opera singers or classical musicians, yeah. these men or ballet dancers. Right. These were great men who were breaking grounds in the art form. When you, you've done film and TV, what kind of roles do you take in those uh, situations? Well, I like whatever they give me, but um, <laughs> a, a lot of them have been dramatic roles because that's kind of my. My oh, they have been dramatic. Yeah, though. yeah. And then you're on the stage in San Francisco. You live in San Francisco. I do. I do. Uh, Teatro Zinzani. Yes. Yes. What is that? Tell me about Teatro that. Teatro Zinzani is the best way I can describe it as vaudeville meets Cirque du Soleil. Oh, right, right. It's right, a right. smaller venue. It's 300 people in a Spiegel tent. Which and it's is, old, right? It's very old. It's very old. It's it's basically it's a European variety with an American oh, sensibility. Right. And uh, I think. It, it, it's it's a great it's a great format. Well, all of those kind of things in San Francisco took on that European feel. Not all of them, but a lot of yes. things in San Francisco were more apt to take on a European feel. That's right. You know, like yes. the circ that that other circus where um, pantomime circus and all those. Yeah, things. and they also had beach 
like yeah, in Babylon, right, exactly. and they and you're right. There's another circus, uh, the pickle circus. That's what I was thinking. Yes, of. because when I was on the Arts Council, we used to fund those very small, even the uh, theatres Zanzani. Yes, yes. Because we believed in those. Well, thank you. <laughs> I mean, no, they really they have a place. And, and people need to see that kind of, yeah. I think. Performance. It's performance. a different kind of performance. Yes. So in my corner, tell me the story. In my corner. It's at the Odyssey Theater. It's at the Odyssey Theater. And uh, it's a story. It's a father-son story. Uh, it's a universal story told in a very unique way. And who wrote it? Um, I wrote it with Lisbeth Hasse. And tell me who's directing it. Jeremiah Chechik. And where'd you find him? Jeremiah, <laughs> Jeremiah, I found, I'm on the street corner. I know, was, just like you were found. <laughs> exactly. No, Jeremiah is a friend uh, of, um, uh, my wife is a, an entertainment lawyer. In San Francisco? In San Francisco. And, and she has some clients here. And I was one evening, uh, one afternoon, I was uh, having coffee with, with Rudy Langless. And, he, and I told him I need, I need a director. And I did about, I don't know, two minutes of my show. And just from that, he said, Okay. That's great. So, did he have the same kind of idea that you had toward what was going on? Yes. We kind of speak the same language. And um, Jeremiah really, he, he started in theater, but he's a film director. Ah. He's directed um, Benny and June with oh, Johnny Depp. Oh, I love that. And, yeah. and National Lampoon's kind Christmas of Vacation. Kind a little bit off. Yes. A little offbeat. That's exactly right. And... And he's offbeat. I think I'm a little, and you're offbeat. little offbeat. And 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 we get a beat to music. Is it autobiographical? Uh, it is. It is. But <laughs> you we, and your but, father. Yes, yes. Uh, who is from Puerto Rico? I am what they call a New Yorkian. Oh no. A Puerto Rican from New York. <laughs> I see. And I my see. mother's Italian, so it's it, it has all of that in it. Does it make a difference what theater? Because you said it's going to go back east. What size the theater is? It for me, it really doesn't. Um, I. But for some reason, right now we've been doing 99 seaters. Um, well, that's also a union uh, 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 yes, situation. Yes, yes. But it doesn't matter. I could do it for 400. I could do it for 600. I could do it for 400. And how many people on stage besides uh, three in the? There are three musicians and myself. Oh, is that it? You do it all? It's like a one-person Joe Orac Ac Orac play. Yes, it's a play with. <laughs> I happen to play the characters in it, but it's a it's it's such a story that Jeremiah and I. We, it's a play. It's a narrative. How many play, people do you play? I play five. Oh, you really do? Yes. And then yeah. how does he change you? Do you costuming changes? No, no costuming changes. No set. There's just a boxing rig on wheels. You know, it's a, a thing that, you know, you know a speed bag? Yes. The box of punches. It's for there. The, the yeah. rhythm. Well, we have that on wheels. So at one point, I dance with that. It it's becomes my oh, mother wow. and it becomes my father. And then later on, we we set it down and I hit it. And I played it with the band. So you have to be in physical shape. How do you stay in physical condition? Oh my gosh! <laughs> it is so Joan. It's so physically demanding. <laughs> I bet. I had a, a, a top ten middleweight contender come and said, "That's like a fifteen round fight." <laughs> That's right. So you know, it. it I, I I I um I do cross training. You know, I I try to. I do a lot of stairmaster. And, oh, you do. Uh, yeah, just to keep my. What legs about food? Healthy food? Only. Really? Yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, um, I'm at a stage in my life that I have to put the, a really good fuel in to get <laughs> the <laughs> most out of. <laughs> to be punching, dancing, talking, acting, singing, and singing too. Boxing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's a lot in, in there. This is going to be great. Oh. And we're going to see it all over, Please right? Please come. Yes. You're going to yes. see it. You're going to have it all over the U.S. I, I believe so. You're going to take it to Europe too? Uh, that, how'd you know? Are you? Yes. <laughs> good. I want to take it to France. Uh, uh, Germany, and we have uh, interest in Shanghai. Fantastic. Yeah. Good yeah. luck. Thank you so it much, so Joan. It's so great to meet you. Nice thanks to for meet coming. you. Thank and you. And thanks for watching our show today. Keep writing to J-A-Q-U-I-N-N-1 at AOL.com. See you next time on the Joan Quinn Profiles.